we've been talking about creating a prosperity culture or a culture of prosperity. I don't really remember which one I said before. Uh, several pages past that in my notes. So whatever I said first, that's what it's called. Is it creating a prosperity culture? Yes. Creating a culture of prosperity. There we go. That one sounded better anyway. Um, we are moving toward a significant change in the culture of this ministry. One of the things that is a signal for culture change is increased warfare. Anytime you are experiencing growth, you have to, I was talking to Pastor Diana and uh, we were acknowledging the fact that the devil has been making coordinated attacks on the families in this church. You know, we have an enemy. Just because you got saved, and just because you come to church, and just because you're faithful to church and all that, just because you read your Bible every day, does not mean life is going to be great in and of itself. Because you have an enemy. What makes your life great is recognizing the victory you have over that enemy. When you are in a war with an inferior enemy, like the devil, who has no power over you, it's not going to be attacks from the front because he doesn't have the power to overcome you. He's already been defeated. So he's going to sneak around the back or come through the side because he's sneaky. He's the master of operating in darkness. Our greatest weapon is the light of the word. Darkness cannot overcome light. Anytime you turn a light on, all the darkness in this area goes away. The devil will beat you in any area you, you leave in the dark. Whenever there is a significant culture shift in the body of Christ, where we get closer to the culture of the kingdom of God, the devil increases his attacks on us. And he'll do it through every crack that you leave it. This is a warning and an encouragement because I have observed coordinated attacks on the families in this church since the beginning of the year. Coordinated attacks on the marriages, on the children. Because the culture of this church is changing. It's going forward into being more like the kingdom of God than it's ever been before. And the devil is playing every card he's got left. When the devil beats you, it's because you weren't watching. It's not because he's stronger than you, because he's anything but. But if you're not watching, he'll steal. Then he'll kill, then he'll destroy. So you have to be on your guard. That little insecurity that you've always had for the longest time, you got to let that go. Because that's a crack. And you, can, you can't, you can pray and study and spit and scream and roll and jump up and down all day. But, with, but if you nurse that hurt from your childhood that you just made a part of your personality, that's the crack he's going to use. He's going to have your spouse say that one thing or do that one thing that hits that spot. And then strife is going to be bred. And where envy and strife is, there is every other evil work. And that's all the devil wants. He doesn't care how he gets in. He just wants to get in. So you turn your light on every day and shine it in every corner of your life. Put it on yourself. Put the light of the word on yourself. What about me have I just not attended to? It's not always the, it, it's not going to be the obvious. 
it's going to be the thing you leave unattended because it's not making a lot of noise. The number one reason people die prematurely with health and medical issues is because when they were young, they didn't attend to their health as if they were going to get old one day. They just run, 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 eat whatever they want to eat. And then when they hit 50, they act like it's a surprise. <laughs> you got heart problems now, or you got blood sugar problems, or you got kidney problems, or this, that, or the third. But you've been drinking 42 pounds of sugar a year since birth. That catches up to you at some point. But because you're not feeling the pain today, you act like that habit is not a problem. That's how the devil gets you. He gets you that way in the natural, and he gets you that way in the spiritual. He will let you ride for so long so that your guard goes down, so that you stop intentionally attending to an area because it's not hurting at the moment. And then right when you're getting ready to develop into a new area, to a new stratosphere, he comes back in and he pulls that plug. And to everyone else, it looks like it's out of nowhere. But it's just been sitting there that whole time. Be mindful. He's been working on us because God is working in us. Yeah. It's not coincidence. We have an enemy. You have to wake up in the morning consciously aware that your enemy is trying to kill, steal, and destroy you in some part of your life that day, and he'll go as far as you let him. When I get up in the morning, I make a conscious effort where my marriage is concerned, where my finances are concerned, where my spiritual life is concerned. Even if we had a great day the day before, I don't ride that into the next day. I get up that morning with a specific intentional set of habits that address everything the devil could get me in. And anything that I miss, the Lord's going to bring that to my attention in my morning fellowship. That, hey, keep an eye on that. And it can seem out of the blue, but that's what he does, because I can't see everything. But he sees all. He knows what the devil is. And he'll say, hey, don't do this for the next six weeks. And then at the, and it might sound strange or unexplained, but he's guiding me around and over all the traps the devil set up that I don't see. You have an enemy. He's trying to destroy you, and he will if you're not watching. Not because he's stronger than you, but if you leave him unattended, you will fall into his trap. That's my warning. That has nothing to do with tonight's message, but that's my warning. Because <laughs> He's been working on every relationship in this church for the past few months. And it's not a coincidence. He's looking for cracks. He's testing. I used to, uh, I used to be a, a heavy mobile equipment mechanic. And one of the things that we did was we did what's called, we tested fuel injectors for diesel engines for aircraft carriers. And a fuel injector on your car is like that big. Fuel injector on those motors is like this big, right? And you put them in a machine that, that applies extreme pressure to the injector to see if there's any cracks. And you have to put it in a special case because if it blows up, it spits metal shards everywhere and people die, right? So they, you put it in a special container that holds it so that if there's a problem. And you test it. And you've got a meter you've got to watch. And it's got to get to a certain level of pressure to make sure that there's no cracks, make sure there's no breaks in any of the seals. You apply pressure to something, and wherever there's a crack, it breaks. You're looking for that, because you don't want to put that on the, on the boat, and then it go out to the Atlantic somewhere, and that engine don't fire up. It's a big problem. I've seen what happens when you apply a lot of pressure to something with a small crack in it. Not pretty. So that's my warning. Now let's get into the nice message. So be mindful of your cracks. Take that how you want to take it. Keep an eye on your cracks. Because that's where the devil's hiding out. 
The devil's hiding out in your cracks. Well, seal them up. <laughs> that was for you, Dad. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mother, you're way too polite for that. <laughs> Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We've been talking about the tithe and all things being equal. We will get to a good jump off point from tithing into, if if we end tonight like I intend to, we will get from tithing into the next level of giving. You know, the thing about tithing is it's two things. It's both the foundation of the kingdom of God financial system and that all kingdom of God finances rest on the tithe. And it's also the ceiling in that you can't outgrow your tithe. It's what protects and covers all your other forms of giving is your tithe because The tithe is sacred to God. We talked about that last time. How the first sin of man was a tithe violation. How that tree was sacred to God and the man stole from that tree. But God gave man dominion over that tree and he gave him responsibility unto it. He was to dress and keep the garden and everything in the garden, including that tree. He just wasn't to eat from it. So to foster a covenant of trust between God and man, God gave the man something that was sacred to himself and put it under the man's power. And the man violated that trust by taking from what wasn't his. And we talked about how God left that tree in the garden for the purpose of man to be able to be trusted. That's how you develop character. You give what is sacred to you to someone else, and you trust them with it. And that person who is entrusted with it develops their character by how they handle what's sacred to someone else. If you can't be trusted to handle what is sacred to someone else, you can't walk in what's sacred to you because it's a, it's a character issue. It's not just about whether the, tr- the tree wasn't magical. It was just set aside. It was just set aside. Now, we're going to jump through a few scriptures tonight and see what the benefit of the tithe is. Now that we have a better understanding of the nature of the tithe. And like I said, now if you want to do some homework, the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, uh, how the tithe was encoded into the Law of Moses, and how the Jewish people revered the tithe and how God commanded them to tithe. There's a couple scriptures I'll give you at the end for your homework if you're interested. But as valuable as that is, I'm I'm not diminishing the value of that knowledge at all, I want to go deeper into the heart of tithing in that even if it were never made a regulation, because the first time man tithed correctly, There was no law. Every time man, every time a man, uh, Abraham did it, his son did it, Jacob did it, every time they tithed, there was no law requiring it. They did it out of a love of God and out of an understanding of the covenant they had with God. And that's the heart of the tithe. You tithe because you love God enough to not violate what's sacred to him. If there was never a, an ordinance, if there was never anything attached to it by way of blessing or cursing, the heart to tithe should still be there. Because if you can withhold 10%, such a minuscule amount, from God who has withheld nothing from you. That speaks volumes about how you perceive God. 
far more than any worship or praise or even a gift you could give. Because all he's requiring is 10%. But we required everything from him. In Genesis 1, we know the story. God makes the earth, the heavens, and then in chapter 1, verse 28, he makes the man. Verse, verse 26, God says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and all that good stuff. Follow the air, the trees, the birds, the animals, all that good stuff. Man has dominion over all the earth. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. We talked about that. And verse 28 is where I want to get to. And God blessed them. So man is created, and then he's blessed. So at the very beginning of man, mankind walks in the blessing of God. And he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Have dominion over it. Subdue it. So at the beginning of man's life, at the beginning of our existence, we were made to be blessed by God. God blessed us at the beginning. I want you to hold that point, keep a pin in that, because that's important. Man began blessed by God. Now go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is arguably the most tragic scripture in the entire Bible because it's the fall. And I won't read the entire thing because we, we should be familiar with it by now. And if not, go back and read Genesis chapter 3. The woman has several conversations with the serpent until he beguiles her. The Bible says that she was beguiled. She was deceived in that she was lied to. What the serpent said was a lie. But the word beguiled goes beyond being deceived. It goes beyond just being tricked. It goes into developing a lust for. When someone beguiles you, they fill you with such an imagination for a thing that you begin to lust after it. The word beguiled has a, leans more towards temptated, temptated, that's not a word, tempted, unto lust because the serpent didn't just show up and tell this woman, ah, God lied to you about that tree. Go ahead and have some. And then she was like, okay. She was not a fool. She was not an idiot. She left a crack open. She left a crack. What was the crack? The crack was she kept talking to the serpent. Once she figured out what the serpent was about, she should have cut off all communication. But she maintained communication with an opposing view of the tie. The serpent began to give her a different idea of that tie, and she just kept talking to him. She kept talking, and every time you have a conversation with the devil, he's wearing you down. And you got to understand that. Every time you have a conversation with the devil, where you let him talk, he's wearing you down. See, I don't have conversations with the devil. If I got something to say to the devil, I'm going to do all the talking. And it's coming from the word. I'm going to tell the devil what the word says, and then that's it. I don't have to hear anything he has to say, because nothing he says to me is true. This, we don't have two-way conversations. If I, once I recognize the devil in the area, I tell him what the word says, and then I send him on his way. I don't, I don't need to hear his point of view. This is not a democracy. This is not a democracy. The law has been given. God had given the command. He had designated this tree as a tithe. That was all she needed to know. Any other voice should have been irrelevant to her, but it wasn't. So she began to have these conversations, and the serpent began to speak to her until lust began to form for the unclean thing or the, the set-aside thing. And then she took it, and her husband took it, and the rest we know. I want to go to verse 17. Now remember, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, mankind is blessed. First thing God did after he made them was bless them. After they touched the tithe, 
Genesis 3.17, And unto Adam he said, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying, Do not eat of it, cursed is the ground. For your sake, because of you, the ground is cursed. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. I want to focus on that word curse and that focus on that word sorrow because we see those words pop up later on in the word. Go to Proverbs chapter 10. We know this scripture very well. We should if we don't. We should. Everyone loves this scripture. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich without sorrow. When the tithe is violated, a curse brings sorrow to all gain. This is important. Because what God does not tell the man in Genesis chapter 3, he does not say the earth will no longer bring forth. The earth will still produce for him. But it will do it with sorrow from there on. It will, he will, it will only produce with sorrow and toil because he's not blessed anymore. So his gain is now cursed. His profit is now cursed. We see this same point reiterated. Go to Malachi chapter 3. If ever tithing is taught in this church, Malachi 3 has come up once or twice. Go to verse 9. Actually, go to verse 7. And the whole book of Malachi is a good read. God is rebuking the children of Israel because they have demoted him. They're enjoying his benefits, but they've demoted his tithe and the culture he's, he's set for them. They've begun to bring things in and take things out that shouldn't be touched. Verse 7, Malachi chapter 3, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinance and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, when did we leave? You see, their culture had changed. They didn't even realize how far away from God they had gotten. Because they didn't, they didn't do it. Their fathers did. And when, they, when he says their fathers, he means several generations back, you guys started switching up your culture to be more worldly, and you got off the path. Now, I'm rebuking you, but you grew up like this. You grew up in a culture that demoted the tithe. You grew up in a culture that didn't honor the tithe. You grew up in a culture that didn't honor my way of doing things. But it began with your fathers, your forefathers. It began with your granddaddy wasn't tithing. So he didn't train your daddy to tithe, so he didn't train you to tithe. That's why you're asking this dumb question. Where did we go wrong? Because this is all you've known. Will a man rob God? Verse 8. He says, you've robbed me. But you say, where have we robbed you? And he answers, in tithes and offerings. Now, verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, because you have robbed me. The whole nation has robbed me. This is the Lord speaking through the prophet Malachi to the people of Israel. He says, you're all cursed because you robbed me. Do we see the consistency here? The curse, so the blessing, brings wealth without sorrow. When you violate the tithe, you are cursed, and then your wealth 
only comes at the expense of sorrow and toil. Now we say, well, that makes sense. But now let me ask you this. If I were to take a poll, and I'm not going to, but if I were to take a poll, who in here would say, I'm a faithful tither? You would say, I pay my tithes every week or whenever I get paid, whatever my pay cycle is, I pay my tithe. Let me ask you a question. What does your heart say about your tithe? You know, when we were kids, our parents would give us money to put in the offering. And that was because as children, we didn't have a way to make our own money. That made sense. They were teaching us the habit and the culture of tithing. As children, we didn't really have an emotional attachment to that money because we didn't work for it. Money was just something your parents handed you. Here's a quarter, here's a dollar, here's five dollars, whatever. So it was easy. You got it. You, maybe you got it that morning. I remember on Sunday morning, we would line up and dad would, all right, you put that in the offering today. Sometimes you got it on Saturday night. Sometimes you got it in the service. You weren't really connected to that money. You were just practicing the culture, which is important at childhood. It's very important that you give your children money to put into the offering, parents, because they have to practice the culture. But then you get a little older and you start earning your own money. And that's different. Because when it's not being handed to you anymore, when you're working for it, it comes attached to you. It comes attached to your heart. It becomes a representation of you in that bucket or in that envelope. Now, the value of that tithe, because a dollar is a dollar. But here's what the people in Malachi, here's where they messed up. It wasn't that they had stopped tithing. It wasn't that they had stopped tithing. It's that they had devalued the tithe to the point that, quick history lesson, the tithe was either going to be cattle or crops, depending on your trade. It, I don't have time to get into numbers in Deuteronomy, or Leviticus in Deuteronomy, rather. Deuteronomy spells out the specifics of the different tithes, and what they could be. If you were going to tithe a lamb, it had to be a spotless lamb, a lamb without blemish, firstling of your flock. It couldn't be any lamb. Now, you could have a thousand lambs in your flock. You couldn't just grab one and tithe it. It had to be specifically the firstling of the flock, the firstborn, and it had to be a male without blemish. A lamb's just not a lamb. The value of that lamb as a tithe mattered. You, could, you couldn't just grab one on the way out the door and say, this is just a lamb. That lamb got a broken leg. Well, it don't matter. We're going to kill it anyway, sprinkle the blood all over the altar, and do the thing with the wave offering and the heave offering and all that stuff. We're going to do all that anyway. So if the leg's broken now, it's going to break later. We ain't worried about that. You couldn't think that way. But that's what they were doing. They were still going to the temple. They were still making sacrifices. If you read Malachi, it's not that they stopped making them. It's that they're bringing the blind animals. They're bringing the lame animals. They're bringing the sick animals. They're bringing the stuff that has less value to them. A lamb is just a lamb in their eyes. But to God, only a certain lamb was a tithe. Now, we don't tithe animals and crops anymore. We tithe money. So when we are tithing money, we do our math. We say, well, this is 10%. Man, what I could do with this money. I didn't have to tithe it. But I'm going to be faithful, and I'm going to tithe it. But you know, the light bill will come up tomorrow. And we can afford it, but it's going to be slim. We ain't going to be able to go to the movies this week. That's all right. 
I'm going to just keep going this way because Pastor Dan looking at the books. And if my tie drops, she's going to say something. I know she is. That lamb is blind. That lamb has a broken leg. Because it was the heart. It was the value of the thing to you. God, in his wisdom, allowed for various levels of quality of tithe based on the income of the person doing the tithing. If you didn't have a lamb, for instance, you could bring a turtle dove. But it had to be a certain type of turtle dove. It had to be a young dove. You couldn't bring that old one that was getting ready to die. I'm trying not to get too into Hebrew history here, but there are actually two tithes. There was the first tithe, and then there was a second tithe. And the second tithe was, in, was consumed in the gates by the people. You, people would travel. The gates of the city is the, the hub of the city. It's the, it's, it's the center of commerce. It's where all of the elders would go and rule over the people. Whenever you see the word gates in the Bible, it's not literally talking about just a door into a city. It's actually talking about the seat of power over that city. Because in the old days, you built a city, then you built a wall around that city, then you put a gate in that wall, and you put all your leaders at the gates. So the leadership and all the main commerce and things, that's where they gathered. So the gates of hell, for instance, aren't just the physical door. It's actually the, the government. Of it. I'm trying to get too deep. Anyway, long story short, the second tithe was brought to the gates. Everybody traveled for miles from however far out they were with their tithe. If you were a farmer and you had a large crop, you might be traveling with several caravans worth of grain. And then everybody would gather this tithe to the gates. And they would make food. They would have a feast. And they would worship and celebrate with their tithe. But there's a provision that if you were too far away and you couldn't travel with that much stuff, you could sell it, convert it into money, then bring the money. When you brought the money, you could spend the money on something that was desirable to you and then consume that. Because the idea of the second tithe was for there to be a great celebration around it. Why is that important to Malachi? That's important to Malachi because God understood that not everybody had a perfect sheep. So there was always a high value thing you could bring. That thing of highest value to you could be your tithe. Jesus reiterates that with the widow with the two mites. That was the highest value thing she had, so it qualified. So even though God had very specific conditions for what qualified as a tithe, he was still gracious enough to allow for different people with different backgrounds and different skills, and different income to all have a tithe that would be weighed equally in his eyes. But they couldn't even keep that. And this is where the curse on them came from. Because even though they could have tithed their best, they chose to tithe their least. The amount wasn't the issue, it was the quality. So maybe you're tithing 10% of your income. But you determine the quality of the tithe by the heart, because 10% is a numerical value nowadays. It's not a, it's not a thing. It's, if I make 100 bucks, $10 is my tithe. If you bring $10, but you did not honor it in your heart, God always attached celebration to the tithe. He always attached love. He always attached his heart to it, because it's about the covenant trust you have that I have been a good steward over what you've given me. You see, God's joy in the Garden of Eden was coming in and out. And every time he came, he could converse and commune with his man. And he could share the secrets of the universe with this man and trust him with it. You see, God could trust the man with the heavenly secrets because the tithe had not been touched. So he knew 
He knew that this man would not eat of that tree. So there's nothing I can't trust him with. I can give him the entire kingdom because he won't touch that tree. And it's right there. And there's no angels around it with, sw- with flaming swords. That didn't come till later. There's no, there's no barrier to him touching that tree except his love for me. The only thing preventing him from touching that tithe is his love for me. That's trust. God trusted the man, and the man trusted God, because all God told the man was, don't touch it. You see, the the seed of distrust that the serpent sowed into the woman was, you know God's keeping a secret from you. He don't want you to eat this tree, because when you do, you're going to learn something he don't want you to know. He sowed distrust of God into the woman, and then she nurtured it until she began to lust for the unknown. Which, of course, was a lie because God told her exactly what happened to the eight tree, and that's exactly what happened. When you devalue your tithe, you do it by lusting for the unknown benefit of keeping it. And we do this subconsciously sometimes. So even if you tithe it, even if you give it, rather, you may not have tithed it. You see, my tithe is sacred. My tithe is sacred. I don't even put my tithe in the same bank account as my other money. When I go to the bank and I make my deposit, my tithe goes into a separate so that it's not mingled with my everyday spending. What's on my debt, my, my tithe is never on my debit card. It's the first thing that gets transferred. If I get paid in cash, it goes in a box until church day, whether that's Sunday or Wednesday. It does not go in the wad of cash I keep in my pocket. It does not go in my wallet. Now, that's me. Because if I'm out and about and You know, sometimes your tailpipe falls off the bottom of your truck, right? (laughs) Which happened to me recently. Crazy, right? Turns out there was a factory defect in the design of the exhaust system that I wasn't aware of until a few days ago. So now I got to get that fixed. Now, it's not a problem. It's not expensive. But if I had that money in my pocket, I need to swing it here real quick and go ahead and take care of this. And I'll, I'll get it. I'll, get, I'll make the tithe up on the next check, and I'll just put double in. No. No. Because now I've made what doesn't belong to me something useful for me. And it doesn't matter if I think I can make it up. It's not about the amount. Even if I got a windfall of a million dollars and said, okay, God, here you go. That $100 or whatever it is has not been tithed. We have to return our heart to the tithe. We have to return our heart to the tithe. Yes, it's a spiritual ordinance, but you see, you're not judged by how many rules you follow. You're judged by the heart of God that you follow because God sees the heart. He sees past the action. Pastor Diana may see the books, but she don't know how much money you make. She don't know if you're tithing or not. She just knows what comes in. We don't know if you're tithing or not. Just because you put it on a tithe line does not make it a tithe. You do know that, right? It's not a tithe because you wrote it on the tithing line. The reason why we divide that up is so that we can give you credit in the system a certain way, but that's so that you can be accountable to your own tithing. It's not, it doesn't magically bestow tithing privileges to the amount you put on the line. That's not what the envelope does. That's not how that works. Just because you write it on the tithe line does not make it a tithe. It's only a tithe when it's tithed from your heart first. The status you assign to it makes it a tithe. 
and if it's 10%. Don't try to assign special status to 5% because you can afford that. It don't work like that. I'm trying to be very clear because you know, I don't want to leave any loopholes, you know. I don't want to leave any loopholes because somebody will go, oh, well, I can, I can believe very strongly for 5%. <laughs> no, it does not work that way. You're not believing anything except for lack. You know, when you, you, know, you believe for lack, when you are faced with a financial challenge, your reaction to it shows what you believe. And many people believe for lack. They immediately go to, how am I going to afford this? Or how am I going to pay for this? Or I can't afford this. I can't pay for this. Let me figure something out. You're believing for lack. What would happen if you just didn't believe you couldn't afford it? You say, well, I can't pay my bills with belief. But you can receive. You only receive by faith. And let me tell you something. One of the manifestations of tithing, I got a few minutes left. One of the manifestations of tithing that gets overlooked because everybody's thinking about money all the time. Remember I said at the beginning of this series that this is not just a money message. One of the best manifestations of tithing is favor. Because the blessing of God maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. Addeth, addeth no sorrow. We don't say addeth anymore. Adds no sorrow. We overlook the value of favor because we're always looking for dollars and cents. Let me explain something to you. The tithe brings the blessing. The blessing manifests in many ways. Dollars and cents is actually not the most common effect of the blessing. Favor is. Favor is. Now, favor can yield financial return. Because before you get the wealth, God removes the sorrow. Okay. I, I used to teach piano. And when I first started teaching piano, I was, I was 19, 20, somewhere around there. A long time ago. And I was doing pretty good. I was making pretty decent money, especially for a guy with no bills. I had one credit card that might have been 300 bucks, and I had a car payment because I had just bought a new Mustang. I was living with my parents. I was eating all their food. I was watching all their cable. It was great. And I was probably making, on a good month, because I'm a very good teacher, on a good month, I was probably making $3,500, $4,000 a month. And I probably had $600 in bills a month. It's a lot of money for a 20-year-old, you know, with no bills besides his car. I had to pay no rent. Nothing. I didn't save any of it. I don't know where any of it went. I'm talking about I was blowing three grand a month on stupid stuff. I can't tell you where it was. I don't know what happened to it. I should have just paid the car off. That would have made sense. I could have paid the car off in about six months if I just... I was dumb, y'all. I was dumb. I told y'all I was stupid. I was talking to my wife. And I was reminiscing, no, I, I, was, I was talking to my wife about it, but I was talking to someone else. I was reminiscing about my father's advice. He said, son, I was 12 years old. He said, if you're going to learn this piano, you're going to learn it right. He said, because if you learn this piano, you make all the money you want to make. He said, you learn this thing right. That was prophetic. Let me explain something to you. I've never had a low-paying job. I've only had one job. I'm not counting that warehouse thing, Phil. Because I didn't stay there very long. I was like, nope, this is not me. And I quit that job quick. I never had a low paying job. Every job I've taken behind that piano has been high paying. Because that man prophesied that. He said, you learn it, you learn it right, and you can write your own ticket. Make as much money as you want to make. I've never made less than $35 an hour behind that piano. When I was teaching back then, I got an offer from a hotel chain to make $300 a night playing for about two hours. The guy said, you come here every night, any night you want, play anything you want for about two hours, I'll pay you 300 bucks every night. Some of y'all looking at me like, why didn't you do that? <laughs> Could have did it. 300 bucks a night, five nights a week, 
That's 1,500 a week. It's not bad for about eight hours of work. Right? I can make any amount of money I want behind that thing. But anyway, I taught, I was doing good. Then I got stupid. I quit that job. That was dumb. Years go by. Last year, now I own my own company. I'm very busy. I don't have time to teach anymore. Some people have asked me, come back and teach. I said, I can't, I can't do it. I get a phone call from the, from the district manager of Guitar Center, largest music retailer in the world, right? He calls me. He says, look, you don't know me. I don't know you. But your name popped up in our system. It's been in our system for about six years. He said, are you a teacher? I said, I used to be. I said, but I haven't done it in 12, 15 years at this point. I said, I, I don't. He says, will you come back and will you come teach for us? He said, this is what we could pay you, and we'll do this for you. Just, we need, we need you. I said, I can't do it, and, I, and I, I didn't take the deal. Two months go by, calls back. You still interested? He bumped up the offer. I said, okay. I can do a couple of days, a little bit, a few hours a day. I said, I, I'm too busy. I got too many things to do. I need to be in control of my schedule. He said, that's fine. He said, I'll give you 70% off everything we sell. And I'll pay you this much. You just show up and do what you do. So I showed up. Now, when I got there, there were other teachers. Some of them had been there for years and might have had eight students. I was there for two months, and I'm, I'm, I'm booked up with a waiting list. So that means if one of my students doesn't show up, they can't get a makeup lesson because I don't have any time. I'm booked up. I started in September. I was booked up by the end of December. I'm the only teacher there that's fully booked up. <laughs> Manager comes to me and says, would you go full time 40 hours? I said, I can't do that. Now, I'm, I'm doing the math in my head. <laughs> I know what I was making on like 20 hours back in the day. I said, I can't do that. Oh, but the thought crossed my mind. He said, because look, we got a whole two other days worth of students. We, we want to give them to you because when people sign up, we, put them, we send them to you because everybody likes you. The other teachers are giving me the students they can't handle. They said, they quit on me, but before we let them leave, we told them, hey, we got this guy, go with him. Now I've had them for months, and they're having a good time. That's favor. See, I'm a blessed man. Now, now put money in my pocket, sure, but it's done it on my terms. It's done it on my terms. Everything I do ends up that way. Not because I'm so special, but because I'm blessed. Because I'm a tither. My habit of honoring the tithe keeps me blessed. Because I'm blessed, I only make wealth without sorrow. Now, I don't mind work. I'll show up to work. But I will not toil and I will not sorrow. Because my heart is in the tithe. And when I have a financial challenge, because I don't have financial problems, when I have a financial challenge, I turn to the tithe. And next week, we're going to talk about what else to turn to. We're going to talk about what else to turn to. Because the tithe, I receive, because the tithe is the door opener. It's the foundation and it's the roof. It protects and covers and it holds us up. But in between the roof and the foundation, that's where you get to live. Right. And we're going to talk about that next week. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for your grace on every single person in this room who has received. I thank you, Lord, that you've opened up windows into their soul and that they will see you and that you will see them. Father, I thank you for giving us a fresh perspective, a fresh heart, and a fresh desire to honor you with all of our income, not just the 10%, but especially the 10% because that's what you require. And you have a right to it. You have a right to your tithe because you've given everything to us with holding nothing. It pleased you to give us the kingdom, the Bible says. And we walk and receive the kingdom in every area of our life, Lord. So we gladly, cheerfully give our tithe to you, Lord. Rejoicing, knowing that it is the sign and the seal of our covenant with you, Lord. So we thank you for it. Now, as we leave this place for never your presence, we are reminded of another one of your promises. 
divine protection, according to Psalms 91. We thank you, Father, that you've given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, and they bear us up in their hands. So we receive protection from all hurt, harm, danger, injury, death, damage, sickness, disease, or any work of the evil one as we leave this place until we come again together on Sunday to worship, to pray, tithe, give, and to be fed the uncompromising word of truth. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. And we don't want you to miss when we go live again. So if you live in the United States, sign up for Rapture Go. Text Rapture to 757-780-4949. And we'll send you a text message every time we go live. If you live outside of the United States, then subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook so you never miss one of our live broadcasts. We thank you for watching. God bless you.